Good morning. Welcome to the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors meeting this day, February 23rd, 2021. Kylie, can you please take roll? Supervisor Starkey? Here. Supervisor Short? Here. Supervisor Berkowitz? Supervisor Berkowitz, you are on mute. Supervisor Hemmingson? I'm here. Operator Howard? Here. Bob just I got trying to. Supervisor Berkowitz? He's, he's, you got him. And yeah, I'm present him. also, Kylie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we'll pause for a brief moment of reflection. Hey, thank you. Supervisor Starkey, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Supervisor. At this time, we'll go to County Council. Joel, is there anything to report out of closed session? No, nothing to report. Okay. Jay, do we have any introduction to new employees today? Uh, not at this time. Okay. Then I'll request any deletions, corrections, or additions from the board members to the agenda. Okay. Chair Howard? Yes, sir. Uh, I do have one urgency item that came up late on Friday regarding a, an emergency declaration that I would like the board to consider if we could put that on as an urgency. Correct. And um, let me just pull it up here real quick. And this is a emergency item as it relates to um, the winter storm events and uh, closures of various highways in Del Norte County as a result of these uh, winter events that have uh, are circling around essentially disaster declaration for Del Norte County as it relates to the winter storms. And I would move to add that item to the agenda as an urgency item. We have a motion. I'll have a second. We have a second. <clears throat> okay, public comment on adding that item as an emergency agenda. <laughs> Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Thank you, Kylie. Um, Kylie, please pull the vote. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Here. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right. At this time, that item is now added, and we'll go ahead and start our brief reports. Supervisor Starkey, can you please start us off? Certainly. Um, since our last meeting, I attended a food task force meeting. Uh, the numbers are actually down with regard to families accessing um, the food banks or food assistance throughout Del Norte County. They're not quite sure why there's been a decline in that. But yesterday, I do believe that legislature has approved additional funding if necessary um, by passing the state COVID-19 stimulus package. So more food bank money will be available. I attended the first five meeting. I had an opportunity to meet the other commissioners. I had a first five follow-up meeting and I'm so appreciative of Angela Glore. She spent three hours with me going over what I needed to know with regard to first five, their funding sources, the services they provide and their goals for the future. I spent a lot of time on last chance grade, um, answering questions for constituents, speaking with Caltrans, I'm just keeping updated on the current slide activity. Uh, attended a solid waste management meeting, an area one agency on agency meeting, attending two city council meetings. I attended a seminar for social media for new supervisors. I'm a very active person on social media. 
So I do that as a way to recognize positive events that occur in our community, as well as keep people posted on events and matters which affect our daily lives. I attended the Mental Health Services Act stakeholders meeting. I had a lengthy Klamath Dam discussion with County Council. I had a meeting with Senator McGuire. We talked a lot about upcoming legislature, which could help California recover from tourism and COVID's impact on our tourism. And there's a new bill that is going through the legislature, SB 285, that would help um, bring forth more tourism dollars and more promotion of, of coming to California. We talked a lot about the vaccines and the state's efforts to increase the amounts provided to our community. Um, he did note that there will be additional sources of vaccines coming soon. It's not finalized yet, but it's on its way. So that is good news. I attended the Visitors Bureau meeting and they are going to be presenting to the board in April about all their hard work. And it's, it's really amazing the hard work that they've been doing to promote Del Norte County. And I'm excited for you guys to be able to see that. I was very impressed. I attended, attended the LAFCO meeting, which is the Local Agency Formation Commission. And I also spent a considerable amount of time learning about the vaccine program here, just become familiar because I think a lot of people are concerned how to actually sign up. And what I learned was that you can call Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. to the public health number 464-0861 and speak with when the volunteers that are manned to answer that phone to get put on the list for public health. And when they, the state sends us vaccines, you will be on that list if you meet the criteria and the, the people manning the phones will help you with that. But additionally, they are suggesting that you also get on the list with your primary care physician. And so if they get a vaccine and it's your turn and they call you and you say, well, I've already got one from my primary care physician, no harm, no foul, they move to the next person on the list. So um, I think that's important information that we share with the public as well. And that is my report out. Thank you, Supervisor Starkey. Supervisor Short. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, since our last meeting, I attended the North Coast EMS Medical Advisory Committee meeting, uh, North Coast EMS uh, Trauma Advisory Committee. And that was a very interesting discussion on how trauma patients are, are handled in our region. Um, also uh, went back to prison. I, I attended the Pelican Bay State Prison Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, attended Donor Solid Waste Management meeting, uh, City Council meeting, and uh, as Supervisor Starkey attended also the CSAC New Supervisors Institute uh, network and social media session. Also uh, like to brag a little bit for the past couple of weeks, we traveled to Cheyenne and welcomed a new granddaughter into the world about nine days ago. So proud to, to say uh, that everybody is, is healthy and glad to be home. And that's it for me. Thank you, Supervisor Short. Supervisor Hemmingson. Yes, congratulations, Sarah. Um, yeah, I uh, had a few things going on. Uh, had a lot of discussions uh, uh, about the uh, airlines, uh, uh, the talk of uh, moving the hub to Sacramento. Um, and uh, uh, we currently go to Oakland. Uh, and uh, the overwhelming support was to stay uh, uh, with that uh, a destination of, uh, of Oakland, a lot of fine discussion, a lot of information, had a, a lot of calls and a lot of texts and a lot of emails on last chance grade. Uh, so we had a lot of constituent concerns. And of course, uh, Matt Brady has been absolutely outstanding in uh, putting out uh, information both uh, 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 through social media and uh, for me personally, uh, texting me on some issues. Also had talked to some constituents about some elk issues. Um, I had a uh, cable committee meeting on the, on the board of directors of a uh, cable committee uh, bringing in a Trans-Pacific cable to uh, Humboldt County. This is not power and I think there seems to be some confusion in the public uh, that this is a power cable. It is not, it is data communications, fiber optic, uh, uh, communications uh, that uh, will be, uh, you know, trans-Pacific. So it's 
going uh, uh, offshore a considerable distance. Uh, I had an RCRC uh, board of directors meeting. Uh, and then later uh, that afternoon, we had a virtual retirement for Greg Norton, who was our president CEO, had been there for 19 years, I believe, or something like that. Uh, he has been a great asset to RCRC. Um, we have uh, uh, since then hired uh, Patrick uh, Blacklock uh, for, uh, to replace him uh, as the uh, uh, RCRC president and CEO. Um, I think he's going to be a good fit. Uh, very happy to see him come on board. Um, so uh, very hopeful that uh, that, uh, uh, that goes well. Um, and uh, uh, going back to the uh, airline situation, we did have a, a Border Coast Regional Airport Authority meeting uh, to uh, solidify the, the uh, uh, continuation of uh, air travel to uh, the Oakland Airport. So we're going to continue on with that. And uh, um, uh, also uh, last week, uh, celebrated my granddaughter's ninth birthday. So it's all good. That's it for me. Thank you, Supervisor Hemmingson. Oh, uh, I did want to mention one thing. Uh, upcoming on the 27th, uh, Raina Tryon is uh, going to celebrate her 100th birthday. So I want to give a little shout out that that is Heidi's grandmother uh, and a very uh, special lady. Uh, she was born actually in Crescent City. Uh, and so for the last hundred years, she's been here. I think that's quite uh, uh, an accomplishment. Uh, so congratulations, congratulations to her and uh, happy birthday and best wishes. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Berkowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's so good to be back after about a month in the hospital. Uh, we're trying to result uh, where my low blood sugar was coming from, but I think they figured it out and I seem to be on the mend and hopefully I'll be able to rejoin you uh, and figuring out how we solve the county's problems. And that's my report. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor. We're, we're all very happy to have you back today. And uh, it was a Thank great you. speedy recovery. So no, happy to have you back in your seat. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's, be, it's been a busy, busy couple of weeks. I'll try to keep it brief as a lot was already touched on. Um, had a meeting with Calio OES Director, uh, Mark Giladucci on, a lot of emergency service actions as it relates to wildfire uh, resilience. Um, had those discussions with a couple other uh, CSAC representatives from our ANR arena and hoping to make a lot of headway into some areas moving forward into this year where Cali OES could take some emergency funding and, and route it to some of the effective areas through the FEMA dollars that come down from the federal government. Also, um, had a great deal of a discussion on that same bandwidth around home hardening. So where grant programs would potentially now become available from those FEMA dollars so we could get into more of a pre preventative course. So um, very little cost essentially to the homeowner or business, but money's now becoming available where you could essentially shore up your house from the outside with uh, steel, let's say on your roof or siding that is concrete, but essentially allowing for a pot of money in these areas in rural California that are highly affected from the dangers of wildfire, allowing constituents to essentially access a pot of funds to help retrofit their homes. And so that's a lot of where the activities and, and funding is being discussed, at least around the federal dollars that follow through Cal OES and uh, I'm eager to see what results from a lot of these discussions as it relates to on the ground action within our rural communities. Um, I won't cover too much of the detail of the uh, BACRA meeting, the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority meeting. Supervisor Hemmingson covered that quite enough in detail. Um, had a, 
multiple discussions, three or four now, uh, with the California State Association of Counties, Agricultural, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee, as it relates to fire and resiliency, and more important pieces as it relates to the Board of Forestry regulations that we will most likely see by July of this year. Um, as you're aware, through Senate Bill 901 that was passed last year, Dodd's Bill, there's gonna be regulations that descend on our shoulders and working very closely with UC Cooperative Extension and uh, our folks in the Community Development Department, specifically Terry Carsley and Heidi Kungstall and Yana Valakovic of UC Cooperative Extension, we were able to get some of our concerns specific to Delaware County off to the Board of Forestry last week and have it on record for their upcoming meeting next week. I'm, uh, I'm really happy with the progress we're making here and more importantly, an understanding on how these regulations could affect not only development in our community, but also fire response. So pretty important discussions and I'll continue paying a great deal of attention to it and advocating on behalf of our rural communities uh, not only from the CSAC level, but also from the Delmar County level. Um, had a minute, meeting with Senator Ben Allen, where we focused a lot around the recycling issues that we continue to face in rural California, but also throughout the state as it relates to plastics recycling. I know we're still dealing with a lot of ramification as it, as it relates to organics recycling and how we're going to implement a lot of infrastructure change when there's very little time to to implement that change as mandated by law that went into effect two years ago now, and where the money's gonna come from to do that. And I know uh, Supervisor Starkey and Supervisor Short are gonna be faced with this head on in the Solid Waste Management Authority uh, joint powers, but uh, I have full faith that they're gonna be able to work a lot of these out and look for exemptions where necessary to get rural California through uh, some of these tough conversations. Also, uh, what I was most shocked about with that discussion with Senator Allen, who prides himself at being one of the more foremost uh, senators out of Santa Monica on, as it relates to uh, waste and uh, movement around such materials, that he was still unaware of this issue we have with treated woods. Uh, um, we still have zero movement in the state of California on the disposal of treated woods. And this is extremely upsetting and his staff hadn't even informed him about this. And here we are in the, the almost the March, still no discussion at the state level on how this is gonna be resolved and how waste essentially considered now hazardous will be disposed of and no movement in the governor's office on it either. So gridlock and bureaucracy at the state level is uh, I guess something that we have come to expect but we shouldn't accept. Um, had meetings with uh, Stafford Laird, Deputy Director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife as it relates to elk. Also had conversations with constituents uh, in the Hayuchi area around the Hazel Time Lane, which is a private drive, not only on uh, access to the river, but um, uh, criminal type issues and activities that have been taking place over there. Um, have been talking to department heads about various frustrations as uh, we move forward in um, conversations around uh, getting things done in the county. And I'll just leave it at that right now. There's a lot that this board needs to talk about in the near future. And I hope we find some mechanisms to do that collectively as a board. Um, vaccine frustration, as everybody's mentioned, continues to be an issue using our lobbies like CSAC and RCRC to get some traction with the state to get vaccines flowing to small rural is gonna to continue to be a huge issue. Unfortunately, the models that have been set up that allow this flow of vaccine to small rural, especially Delaware County, don't benefit us. And we continue to see a slip and a slide in inconsistencies of materials that eventually wind up in, in Dr. Ray Rawls uh, arsenal to get folks that are important to us treated, especially those elderly folks that are extremely important to us. So I hope to have more discussion of this with Dr. Raywald uh, during that time item today. Um, multiple, multiple calls with not only Senator McGuire in the last two weeks, but also Matt Brady, as uh, Supervisor Hemmingson mentioned. Both Caltrans and our Senator have been extremely active in discussions associated with last chance grade. They're on it. Matt has done an incredible job getting emergency funds in order to get materials moved 
it frustrates me to no end that all of a sudden when these materials land on Highway 1, 101, they become ours and not the property of the ocean down below. Um, when you're moving 10,000 yards of material, you can move 1,000 yards a day pretty easy by a conveyor just dumping it over the side of the hill. But unfortunately, the state says now it's the property of Caltrans when it hits our road and it's an environmental hazard. It's frustrating as heck. We could have this highway open a lot quicker, but we need to find mechanisms in order to treat this. And also had a CSAC board meeting um, where we discussed a lot of issues around the budget that the governor has now proposed and what the what's going to go forward here in 2021. So it's going to be interesting as things roll out, but I'll stop there in relation to time and, and uh, move forward with the next items on our agenda. So it is uh, 1022. I think we have time to take up item number 11 real quick here, which is approve and adopt a resolution of the Board of Supervisors of Delnor County establishing a Measure R Transaction and Use Tax Oversight Committee as requested by County Council. Yeah, so uh, the ballot measure promised citizen oversight and the ordinance required the board to create that body by resolution. So that's what this is. Um, you know, the highlights are that it'll be a panel put together from people in the unincorporated area of the county um, and there'd be an application process. Uh, the clerk recorder would kind of screen them and put them, i put five forward for the board to choose. Um, so the board doesn't have to you know, have a bunch of competing motions or interview people. It should be nice and clean. Um, rather than doing every board member choosing somebody like a planning commission, because not all districts have uh, you know, equal number of people in the unincorporated area. What the resolution says is that um, it sh we shall strive for regional balance, but it's not a locked in thing. Um, it'll be a meeting before the proposed budget and then optional after, um, <clears throat> you know, staffed. And then the mechanism that I'm proposing here is that they'll just answer some specific questions. So this doesn't become uh, kind of a large, confusing process. There's just some specific questions that are designed to, to actually create kind of a clean record. Here's what the money was used for. Um, we'll always be able to point to it and say, there's the citizen oversight. That's what was promised. That's what happened. And the board will have that every time it adopts its budget. So if there's any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Questions from the supervisors? I do. Um, and, and this is in the resolution, it doesn't have like what the criteria is for the, the candidates that are gonna apply. So there's an application I'm assuming. Do we have any idea what's gonna be on that application? There is an application. Um, I think Tony drafted it. It asks basic questions, kind of why are you interested, what are your qualifications, um, but not really knowing who's going to want to do this, you know, who's going to apply. Um, I didn't want to bring forward an application for the board to approve and then set in stone. Uh, if you'd leave that to the discretion of staff. And then that can always be part of the public conversation uh, when it comes to the board. Um, but I don't know what really qualifies somebody for this. You know, I think that's a little bit open-ended. Um, you know, let, let kind of see who comes. And if the board wants to create something more specific, we, we certainly can. I'm just not sure what exactly the qualification would be. Well, and I understand that, but it just seems like if you're going to put this on the register of voters to select the best five, what's the criteria in determining what the best is? I mean, that's fair. I mean, if you want to, you know, give us direction to create criteria, we can. I don't know what the criteria would be. I mean, I just think it puts a lot of pressure on our register of voters to have to make that determination. If we get 50 applicants and they have to narrow it down to the best five, but we don't know by which mechanism they decided what the best is. I guess that's my only concern is that I don't feel there's any real guidance. Like, should they have some financial background? Should they have an educational background? Should they have, you know, what are their conflicts of interest? Are we gonna weed them out based on that? I mean, there's just a variety of things that I think that we should clarify before we, we put that out. That's my opinion. We certainly can. I mean, I, I talked to the clerk recorder, the elections official about this. She's seen it. 
she's comfortable with with her role in it. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I would need more direction from the board about what those qualifications should be. Um, well, you know, I don't city, want to admit them. Yeah, when the city did their measure S, they had the application was there and they had the supplemental questions, right? And it was very specific. Why do you want to even be on the, the committee? Um, what personal and professional experience do you have that makes you a good candidate for the committee? You know, so there was some specific questions. And so I think that, I, I just think that we need to kind of guide what that's going to look like. So. Yeah, there's, you know, we can absolutely, you know, bring the questionnaire forward for the board to approve. I, I, absolutely. Joel, I also see Alicia on the line and maybe, uh, maybe she could help answer some of these concerns as expressed by Supervisor Starkey. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out that it also states in the resolution that um, I have the ability authority to appoint a panel and to help make this decision. And I would, if we get a large um, response, I fully intend on forming a panel to help make the decision. My initial job would be to go through the applications, um, make sure that they are qualified as far as live in Del Norte County, registered voter, um, all of that, and that the application is complete. At that point, um, then the decision would be made. You know, if we've got a really large response, I feel that we should bring in um, some other department heads who um, would have something to add, like just where these funds are going to be spent and would have a little more um, information. But it, my job is to make sure that the whole county is going to be represented as far as each district being represented. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure, Valerie, if that addressed some of your concerns, but uh, I think Joel's got the basic uh, concept of what we're looking for there. Okay, so, I mean, you know, sorry, Valerie, go ahead. No, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, I understand, but, you know, to sit down in a room with 50 applications, I mean, I mean, I just, I think that there needs to be some sort of transparency with the public as to why we select certain people. And so I'm just trying to uh, look forward and trying to prevent any kind of problems later on. So I think that if there was, you know, some sort of guidance on what they were looking for, I mean, that's just my opinion. I, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I would just need you to tell me what you want us to use. Well, for one, somebody that understands budgets and county budgets. I mean, that's an enormous undertaking a lot of times um, just to kind of understand why things are allocated the way that they're allocated, um, you know. Yeah, that, I mean, they are complicated and, and the, uh, the CAO and the auditor are, or their designee are uh, non-voting members of the panel to help explain that. Um, I would worry that if we had a, a requirement that you understand county budgets, we wouldn't get five people, um, you know. But I mean, we, we, you know, I can bring forward a form I, we can take with the city as I haven't seen what they did. Um, um, we, we, you know, we can come back. So, Supervisor, are you looking to table this item potentially with, or just give direction at this point in time and pass the resolution? Well, I, I, I don't know how Supervisor Short or Supervisor Hemmingson feel. I mean, this is just one person's observations and opinion. So, I mean, I certainly listen to whatever everybody else is thinking and then vote accordingly, or we could table it and have a discussion later on. Sure. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, we have a lot of experience with our um, registrar of voters. Uh, Ms. Northrup uh, is outstanding at her job. Um, her, her intent to appoint a panel uh, kind of speaks to her integrity in this process. And I think if 
it, you know, if we just were to adopt this resolution and she was to uh, appoint a panel and had a large number of people to, um, to screen, the process by which she made or her panel made the decisions to choose whoever people were so chosen uh, would come to light at that report at the end of that process. It, it would be transparent to, um, to all the, the citizenry and the voters as to how these people were chosen. Um, so I think um, the way that it is set up now, I, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that it is a oversight committee and not an advisory committee. Uh, that we are establishing here. Um, I agree with Joel that if we had to have uh, find five people that knew uh, that knew about county budgets, we probably wouldn't find them. Um, so I I am comfortable with the um, with the process that is put in place with this resolution. Um, Miss Northrop has proven her ability in the past by by far, in my opinion, and. Uh, and with that, I would uh, move to approve and adopt this resolution. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Hemmingson. Yeah, and, and I, I would second that motion, but uh, you know, I would just uh, 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 you know like to say that you're uh, pretty optimistic that you think there's going to be 50 uh, applicants. I think you're going to have a hard time finding enough people that want to be part of this, and and you know, and there's certainly going to be some people that. Uh, uh, maybe you wouldn't want to be on this committee. Uh, so maybe those people would get uh, weeded out. Uh, I'm sure Lisa can take care of that. Uh, I'm pretty confident in her uh, ability to do so. And that way she gets the heat and not us. And so we're all good. Yeah, I just want to say that I was never questioning um, Ms. Northrup's abilities. I'm, I've got the utmost confidence in her. I just felt, as uh, Supervisor Hemmingson just mentioned, that she gets the heat and not us. I, I didn't know that I feel that that is necessarily um, a fair approach. But with that said, I mean, we've all voiced our opinions and there's a motion on the table. So we'll go forward. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Durkee, if, if I made that uh, implication, please accept my apology. I did not mean for that to- No, no, no. I just wanted to be cleared, so. And I was saying that all in my, I don't, I don't think there's going to be a lot of backlash. I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I hate to get too, I hate to get too narrow uh, with this. You know, it's, I, I think it's better to be a little broader in, in trying to be able to bring people in to do this rather than having certain criteria that might eliminate some people. And, you know, I, I, I just think that, uh, you know, we'll give this a shot and, and see what the, the process, uh, uh, how the process works and, and go from there. Uh, but uh, I'm pretty comfortable at this point with the way that it's set up. Okay, thank you very much. If there's no further comments or questions from the board, I'd like to go to the public comment. Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay. Kylie, could you please pull the vote? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? No. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, we're gonna move back to our 1025 time item, which is our public comment period. Members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board. If you're addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Kylie? Sure, I have one written, but it's related to COVID. So I was gonna hold off until um, Dr. Raywald presents. Um, other than that, I am not seeing any hands raised online. Okay, very good, Kylie, thank you. Um, then we'll go ahead and close public comment and move to item number 10, which is our 10.30 a.m. timed item, which is a presentation from Dr. Raywell. Doctor, are you with us today? Good morning, can you hear me? We sure can. 
Um, good. So I'll get started. I'll try and keep it fairly brief. Um, for starters, I don't usually quote the state or national statistics very much when I present to you, but I think yesterday passing the 500,000 mark for, for people dying from COVID related problems in the country is kind of important to note. Um, that's a pretty big number and obviously everyone knows that. Um, locally, we are doing okay. I, mean, we're, I wish we were in a little bit better spot in terms of our case counts, uh, but we know that a good portion of our recent case numbers are centered on some outbreaks. And that has a little bit of a different tone compared to you know, general case, cases emerging from different directions in the public. Um, I'm hopeful that it will not move us in terms of tier status. I don't think it will this week. Um, I'm a little more concerned about next week or perhaps the following week, but we will see. I'm, we're going to actually be talking to some state people today, this afternoon, and I'm going to lay some preliminary groundwork about our outbreaks because I think that does play a factor in, in their determination of where we land in terms of tiers. I, I would like to keep us in the red as long as possible. Um, Vaccinations are what's on everyone's mind, so I'm going to turn to that. Uh, we have a backlog of over a thousand doses that we're waiting to have delivered, which would be great to have because we could expand what we're doing. We can't really expand what we're doing until then. We have enough hand, on hand to cover our mass vax clinic that we're having this week, and we think there would be enough to cover next week's. Um, we are cutting down to almost no new doses for the next two weeks to any of our partners in the community. Uh, I wanna remind everybody that we are still the sole source for vaccine for uh, the medical offices in our, our, our community and our county that are vaccinating their patients. Um, so it's kind of a tight moment in terms of vaccine supply. If we get vaccines this week, uh, everything's good and we're back in business. But right now we're being very cautious and trying to keep our, our inventory from drying up. Um, we probably have averaged about 350 doses of vaccine a week since the vaccine rollout started in terms of getting out into arms. Um, we've sub we received a little over 300 doses of Moderna on an average weekly basis since they started shipping Moderna. And we've also been using uh, a Pfizer allocation that came out of Humboldt County. I've mentioned this before on a presentation. That is almost gone. There are about 50 doses left in the freezer down there as of this week. Um, we have submitted our paperwork to the state to have our freezer certified so we could receive Pfizer. Um, we haven't heard anything back. We're gonna do a little uh, prodding. In fact, in the meeting today with the state people, I'm gonna mention that as an issue that we'd like to know to make sure that we're not missing a step to get ourselves approved. Uh, we'd like to get our second freezer, which is located at Del Norte Community Health Center. We'd like to get that approved as well. And then we could have uh, two freezers capable of receiving and holding Pfizer vaccine. Um, we have plans to try and increase our mass vax clinics to at least a weekly basis, but again, it depends on the supply. You kind of have to match your vaccination program to the supply available at the time. And there have been some signs in our recent allocations that the supply is improving. Um, not huge amount, but it has trended upward. We've had a couple of shipments now in the 400 to 500 dose uh, range. Those are not received by the way, those are part of the batch that are, are waiting to be shipped. Um, but the trend is starting to show up that maybe there's a, a relaxation in vaccine supply. So hopefully that will continue. There's a lot going on at the state level. Um, probably you've all heard about my turn, which is the state uh, vaccination enrollment program. So people can sign up and choose a clinic and go get their vaccination done. Uh, a lot of small counties have voiced repeated concerns with the state about the fact that you can sign up for this uh, in any county and go to another county and have your vaccination done, which would swamp us. I mean, we would be unlikely to get even half of our vaccination allocation into the arms of Del Norte residents if that opens up full bore. So until that happens, we are really hesitant about participating. We are told, however, that we don't really have the option of opting out. We, the expectation is that the entire state is gonna be part of this program. 
we are hopeful that they are listening to our concerns and will allow us to have uh, vaccination clinics that are essentially private for Del Norte residents only, uh, or some other means of blocking out of county or out of state travel to get vaccination. Um, you can make the case that the vaccines are federal property, you know, and there ought to be access. But the reality is, is that there are a lot of folks up and down the state who cannot travel to another county. They have jobs or they're, or they don't have jobs, they're unemployed. They don't have the resources to buy the gas to get somewhere else. So it really creates a, an, an opening for the people who do have the means, who do have the time to, you know, go anywhere they want to get vaccinated. And, and basically it sets up a tiered system of, access based on uh, economics. And I don't think anybody wants to really see that. We'd rather see us getting the vaccines and people who need it the most. So our strategy still is to get as far through our seniors as we can, uh, made some progress. We haven't made a big enough dent in my opinion, but you know, when the vaccine comes, we'll be able to do that. Um, we're strategizing to do some teachers that we've started working on a list of senior teachers. We wanna complete that list and then continue education educators because that's part of the overall state and federal strategy. Um, it'll also include daycare workers. Uh, that's something that people forget a little bit, but it's also true. Um, and then we go further down the list. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the tier lists and the different categories that show up, but just getting through our seniors is a huge, still a huge project. So we've got some time to, to go before we get too far down, too much further down the list. Um, testing is going to change a little bit. This is the last week for Verily. Um, we decided to pick an option from the state to replace them through OptumServe. OptumServe has been doing testing up and down the state. Uh, a lot of counties have been working with OptumServe since the beginning. We are actually gonna be getting a mobile testing unit, uh, which will be available five days a week instead of three. It will be able to move up and down the clinic. So we will have established sites. Uh, we're anticipating Smith River and Crescent City and Klamath. Um, and it's sort of like a food truck for testing. Uh, we've seen pictures of it. We haven't actually seen the truck. It's actually, we are told it's the very first one beyond the prototype. So we are gonna be kind of a testing environment for them to see how well this system works, but it seemed to suit our needs best. Um, it'll be like Verily, there'll be a, a online portal to sign up. It will collect insurance information like Verily did. Uh, it'll give you an appointment time. Uh, it'll be a little different in that it, we don't think that they're going to be able to do drive through like Verily was doing, but it'll be a drive up and walk up kind of situation and a similar testing system where you use the swab, collect the specimen yourself and turn it back into the staff. Um, we hope to have it running next week, uh, the following week by, by, uh, for certain. Uh, got a lot of work to do this week to, to get more details about OptumServe and, and start getting that out into the community so people understand how to access it and get signed up. Uh, so a little more to come about that probably at the next time we talk. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we should cover this morning. And there's always a lot of questions about variants and how that impacts us and how that will impact the state. Um, definitely in the state of California. We don't really know if it's here. I don't think we've seen the kinds of changes we would expect if it was here. Uh, actually looking for variants is kind of complicated and requires some special processing of specimens. It's really hard to do because uh, ideally you freeze the specimens to ultra cold temperature and we don't have that capacity. We have that capacity for vaccines, but we can't, <laughs> we can't do the two tasks at the same time with the same device. But um, we are still watching the situation like everybody else is, and uh, we'll keep people posted if we learn anything new. And I, I think that's all I have. I'm gonna stop and leave time for uh, questions. I'm sure you have some. Sure do. Questions from the board? Okay, I'll go ahead and get started, Dr. Raywald. Um, several points. I'm glad you brought up the testing piece of this. Um, you look around surrounding communities and no matter who the lab is, there definitely seems to be a duration of time that we're dealing with, with getting results back. My hope is that over the last year that would have improved and it definitely doesn't seem to be improving and maybe it will with this new contractor. 
but I all I got to do is look south to my son's college campus to where he gets tested twice a week and has results on his phone within 15 minutes. And the level of frustration that I've had with how testing is occurring, it, it, it I just can't, I can't understand it. Um, it doesn't make sense where some communities could turn around testing within a matter of minutes and other communities like ours, it takes four days. So could you, can you talk to us about testing again? What's the long-term strategy for this? Um, are we always going to use um, outside contractors provided with the state? Are we going to roll some of this in-house and looking forward to the future, how we're going to do this with some of the requirements that we've seen, like, okay, I want to hop on a plane in three days, yet I'm required to have a test within the first 36 hours. How is that going to be accomplished? So if you could kind of address some of that, that would be helpful. Yeah, I, it's always uh, been tougher for small counties to, to really answer the questions, especially remote counties. When you look at the state data about testing turnaround time, it, I mean, it is really quite good on the, the average is really usually less than a day. Um, but there's always, what they don't tell you is what the range is. So there's a lot of outliers like ourselves that are still, you know, sometimes four or five days out at, at times. Um, and that has to do with remoteness. If you don't have a, a testing lab within your county that you run and that you can direct specimens to, uh, as a public health department anyway, uh, you have to depend on contractors or partnerships with other entities or you know, what we're doing with um, Humboldt County and UIHS. That's actually picked up some of our mandatory testing quite well. Um, it is not opened up to the public as fast as we wanted. And there's, unfortunately, there's nothing that I can do to, to make it happen faster. Um, the Optum Serve site will be direct shipping labs, uh, lab tests to the Valencia lab, and they hope to have a turnaround time uh, better than what we were experiencing with Verily because the courier routes are pretty well established. But it's still farther away to the Valencia lab for Del Norte than just about any, anywhere else in the state, you know, except for maybe Modoc. Um, so I don't know that we can improve on that. Um, you know, your son probably is being tested with antigen tests. That's about the only thing that happens that fast, unless they have a very rapid PCR test capacity. You know, they probably do it where he goes to school, but, um, antigen testing is an option that we thought about this since we started getting allocations of antigen supplies. Um, but honestly, our department is so small, we couldn't really figure out a way to set up a testing service using antigen testing within our department. We've encouraged all our local offices, all the local partners to, to use the antigen kits. We've got supplies on hand. Some of them are actually going to expire because we haven't used them yet. Uh, we just haven't had a lot of interest and I don't really know how to change that either. It, mm. the, the biggest user, potential user in the next couple of months will be our school system. And I'm really hopeful that they will because I think it will create a much safer environment. It'll allow some school sports to proceed uh, in a meaningful way with a new sports guidance. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, we're not throwing away our, our Binax Now cards. We're gonna hang on to them because we'd like to get them used. Um, that's the fastest way. It's not the most accurate way, but it's definitely the fastest. And, and it's a very useful test in a lot of ways because if, if someone's positive, it's a reasonable, very reasonable presumption that they are positive and that they are infectious and they need to isolate to, you know, stop transmitting it. So for what it's designed to do, it does pretty well. But, um, you know, short of building our own lab here in Del Norte County, um, which would be kind of a huge step, uh, not likely to happen anymore. Uh, there really is not a good way to match the turnaround times that the rest of the state experiences just because the resources are co-located to those places and the resources are not co-located here. The closest is Humboldt Lab and um, you know they're pretty full, they're pretty busy. We've actually been saved in a lot of ways by having Sutter's Lab here because they've had in-house testing uh, in a limited fashion since the beginning. So we've been able to direct those key cases that we needed to identify quickly and they have never refused us. I mean, they have worked seamlessly to, to you know, keep everything in check. Um, I have nothing but praise for the, the lab and how they've helped us. They supported the nursing home, you know, you know, for months they were processing lab requests from the nursing home. Um, 
that's been our best avenue just because that's, you know, the quickest, most reliable testing resource that we have locally outside of uh, using the, the resources that were sent to us by the state. So that's the problem and the problem has never changed. And I, I don't know if we have a better fix. I honestly don't. Um, I'm hopeful that the Optum Surf site will actually improve our turnaround time a bit. Um, and because it's here five days a week, I think it'll improve access. Uh, but it remains to be seen where just, it's going to, there are going to be a few bumps in the road. Uh, it always is when you start something like this. Now, I appreciate those thoughts. I have two more items I'd like to cover. There's been a great deal of concern expressed by rural county specific to a third party administrator. And in this case, the Blue Shield has been con contracted with. Um, what's been your experience so far, if any, interaction has taken place with that administrator and how things will move forward? Um, we have a scheduled meeting tomorrow, actually. That's going to be our first face-to-face -face local contact with uh, uh, the TPA uh, team. I'm not sure who we're meeting with, actually. But um, what I've been hearing from other counties and the experience so far is we have some ongoing concern about how it affects overall allocation strategy and whether that really will start to limit limited supply again. Um, the TPA has recommendation authority. We, we are told that they don't have final decision-making authority. So they're, they're uh, kind of like an independent third party that helps craft decision-making for the state. Uh, but they're also tasked with some other parts of the whole problem, you know, getting public information out, setting up better testing or a better vaccination resources. Um, getting more sites up and running. Uh, you know, it's a pretty big project that they've taken on. I'm not entirely convinced that they're necessary, but if they do their job well, I think overall they probably will benefit. It's just, we are really worried about the allocation formula that might come out of this, that it will further crimp what we are supplied in terms of vaccination allocation. We know that there's been some talk about redirecting uh, allocations to other entities. And uh, I, I don't see anything necessarily good coming out of that, at least not for us, because our, our main issue is not that we can't vaccinate. It's the main issue is that we just don't have enough vaccine to, to meet all the needs at the same time. Yeah. And, and that's, I guess that's been the ex concern that we can continue to express directly to the governor and his staff. And it was our frustration going into those discussions with that third party administrator. I'm just not um, not sure what's gonna result from it. I, I hope uh, the end piece of your thought is that it will help, but if it doesn't, uh, I wanna be prepared to react to that. So please keep us posted on your discussions. And yeah. the last, yeah, sorry. I, I, w I absolutely will. And, and I know you're following this very closely. So I think next time the board meets, we'll have a, a probably a broader discussion about this topic. Uh, we'll know a lot more then. Okay, so. I appreciate it. And the last thought I'll uh, close with is, is essentially uh, management expectations on a county level as it relates to vaccination. And I know you and I spoke a lot this weekend uh, concerning that with constituents' concerns and, and knowing vaccine flow in and out of the county and if there's a way we could potentially treat that in a web-based platform that would allow for a little bit more transparency where information can be shared with the public. So like we do with our active case count, number of hospitalized, et cetera, is there a way we could build a web platform as simple to access as that, that would allow the community to see how vaccines are flowing into the county? And I'd like you to share your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, I think there is a way. Um it's gonna require a little more resources in terms of personnel than we have right now, but I think we can, you know, the county government as a whole certainly has the resource base to, to put up that kind of data and so people can follow it a little bit better. Um, I put out a little bulletin this morning that kind of summarized our experience so far, and that would be maybe a kind of a template to start from, but, you know, there are, there's data, there's data portals at the state level that are also tracking this for us. Um, and it, you know, it shows breakdown of uh, vaccination by age and by ethnicity, a bunch of other factors. 
And that's kind of what I think people are interested in. But um, I think more people are interested in just when can I get my vaccine? And I don't know that kind of re data reporting is going to really answer that question. Right. Um, I think the, the short answer is you can get your vaccine when we have more vaccine to give. And uh, we're, this week, if we get everything in, we'll have quite a lot for a while and uh, we plan to use it. But yeah, we can, we can certainly take a look at it. I, I think we can expand our, uh, our COVID hub and include something like that. And it's probably a good time to do that. You know, we're, we're in getting more into stride with vaccination and it's becoming more of a regular thing. So uh, it's probably, probably will be useful to have something like that available. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Raywell. I'm going to go ahead and open it up for public comment. Kylie, you did mention you had a written comment to share. Yes, and this is from Mr. Jeff McCadden. Um, it's regarding COVID-19 vaccine and precautions. It says, many of us in the elderly population are wary of the COVID-19 vaccine due to the lack of thorough testing. Given a few months, could it cause body parts to drop off or turn people into brain-eating zombies? Will offspring of vaccinated people be born looking like overgrown, three-eyed, five-armed, 12-fingered Chernobyl polywogs? Recent surveys indicate two-thirds of the population will not take the vaccine. The president and VP took the vaccine on camera, but were they actually injected with the vaccine or simply given normal saline? Were they look alike stand-ins? President Biden recently denied that the vaccine existed before his inauguration. I would like to see all of our local elected officials and executive managers inoculated on camera to display their unanimous faith in the vaccine safety, close-ups of the vial labels and the top tabs being removed and syringes being filled will be important to prove authenticity. While you were at it, Dr. Fossey recently told the public that it only makes sense to wear two masks to prevent COVID-19 transmission. He now adds that three masks are even better. Our county should be on the vanguard of COVID-19 precautions. A video of our elected officials and executive managers demonstrating the first 100% effective COVID-19 countermeasure would be both an inspiration to the world and a credit to this community. They should start by stuffing a sock in their mouth and covering it with duct tape, then stuffing four cotton balls up each nostril, putting on four face masks and topping it all off with a thick clear plastic bag zip tied tightly at their neck. To conclude the video, it has also been demonstrated in China that anal swabs are most effective for testing COVID-19. Thank you for your time and consideration of these modest recommendations. This is really Mr. Jeff McCadden. Thank you, Kylie, for that color. Um, is there any public comment on those live with us today? Um, Chair, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, very good. Any further questions for Dr. Raywell from the board? Uh, uh, Chair, I just had a hand come up. Okay, very good. Please allow them in. That you are on, you just need to unmute your mic. Okay, thanks. I, I wanted to thank Chris and the doctor for the response to my questions and concerns. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, I also would like to ask, you know, because of the problems with 101, and I understand that our vaccines come from Humboldt up 101, it is that going to be an issue with getting the vaccines or are we um, getting some alternate ways of transporting the vaccine other than 101? Um, I'll answer that. Uh, I, thanks for uh, uh, raising the question, actually, because uh, part, of, part of the answer is we do depend on 101 to get the rest of our Pfizer doses. And yesterday we actually, in fact, I went, I took a ride on an air ambulance down to uh, uh, McKinleyville to the airport down there. And then um, someone from Calor picked me up and took me to the vaccine freezer. We picked up the doses for this week. And then I turned right, right, around, right around and went back to the airport and got on the air ambulance and brought them back. That was the only way to solve that problem other than sending someone literally about eight hours by road to circumvent the slide. Um, so yes, it, the slide impacts us. Uh, it's, it also impacts us for getting our testing specimens down to, uh, the UHS lab or to Humboldt lab, because that's the only quick way to do that. Um, that's actually a larger concern at the moment. The Moderna vaccine, um, can come by different routes and we don't really know. We have never asked them if they come up 101 when they deliver it, or if they fly in and then just locally deliver it. 
you know, we do have FedEx delivery by air into our own airport. So I think the Moderna vaccine is going to find a way to get here. Um, we're actually we're going to ask the delivery people when they come uh, to give us uh, uh, a backlog of how they got the vaccine there, if they know, so we can trace backwards just to see if the, the delivery route is as secure as we'd like it to be. But you're right, the Pfizer vaccine for us is a, is a challenge. We only have a few doses left. We have about 50 doses left in cold storage down there uh, as of today. Um, so the slide could be a problem. We might have to make another air ambulance trip. And by the way, I want to thank Cal Orr immensely for the experience. It's something I've always wanted to do is ride in an air ambulance, um, not as a patient necessarily, but just, just to see what it was like. And uh, they have, you know, like they've been doing all along, they've really supported us. So they made it possible for us to get our Pfizer vaccines this week. So I, I want to give them a shout out and thank them. I appreciate those uh, comments. Uh, Supervisor Hemmingson. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Raywalt, uh, I'd like to take a step back about the uh, freezers. Um, I was under the impression that we had three freezer, freezers. You only mentioned two, uh, which is only part of my question. Um, if, if we were able to have those freezers up and running and certified, they would then be able to fly the Pfizer vaccine to us directly. Uh, is that correct? And um, the other thing is my, my understanding is that Pfizer, the next uh, vaccine that they're doing or whatever is not going to require this uh, colder storage. So uh, a little disappointed that we're not up and running on that. I, I realize that's uh, not your fault, uh, but we've had those freezers for uh, quite a while and getting the certification that certainly uh, seemed to be uh, uh, slow at the very best. Um, yeah, it, it has been slow to us as well. Um, I'm not going to make any excuses about it. I, we we had to walk through the process and we think we've, we believe quite strongly now that we've done everything that we need to do at our end to make sure it happens and that it gets certified. Um, the freezer, the third freezer was defective. We are packing it up to send it back. They sent a replacement. Um, we actually think what we'd like to do is configure that freezer to store Moderna vaccine. So we're, we want to reprogram it to a lower cold temperature and make that a large volume storage depository for uh, Moderna, um, which makes more sense to us to be able to do both because we don't need three freezers for Pfizer in a county this size. Probably one freezer would be enough and certainly a second one as backup is more than sufficient. So yeah, it's here. It's just uh, in the process of getting reset to use for Moderna storage. But, um, you know, it, it does raise a question. What, I don't know if they're ever going to validate Pfizer for us or not, because they may just consider us part of the group of counties that are always going to get Moderna vaccine uh, just because we're remote. Even if we tell them we've got the freezers, we're ready to go send us Pfizer vaccine. Our, our hope was that we would have this available that when the vaccination production increased and both vaccines were much more widely distributed and we were doing vaccinating literally everybody like later this spring and summer, we'd have that capacity for vaccine storage and we could use both vaccines in our, in our local efforts. So that was kind of the long-term goal for the freezers. Uh, but there's some advantages to having Pfizer vaccine here over Moderna, believe it or not, even though it requires the ultra cold temperature, once we got it here and we've got it in reliable storage, it's very easy to use. And uh, there's no real advantage to Moderna at that point. Moderna is mostly for keeping it in storage with existing equipment. Once you've got the equipment you need for Pfizer, um, there, there's some advantages to Pfizer actually because of the size of the doses in the vials. So um, yeah, we'd like to see it up and running too. Dr. Raywell, quick follow up on that. The certification, is it state or federal? Uh, state from our perspective, whether they have to get permission from the federal level, we don't know. And yeah, that may, that's a good point. It may actually, the hangup may be that they have to, they had to submit a list to the CDC at the very beginning of the vaccine rollout. And now it's really hard to change that list. We don't know, okay. but I'm going to see if I can find answers to that question this week. Cause, uh, we're meeting today with uh, a state representative who meets with us regularly to handle these kinds of you know, multi-issue questions that spring up from time to time. And she's been really good at helping us. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm pretty certain she's going to help us figure out what we need to do, if anything else, from our end. 
Yeah, please let us know if there's anything we can do for you too. Um, I will. Our, our senator's on top of this, and if there's a difference he could make, I'm quite certain he will. Yeah. All he right. Would. No, certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and move forward with our consent agenda at this time. Items number one through eight on the consent agenda. Do we have uh, a motion? Move to approve consent. Thank you. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Kylie, is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take up that vote, please. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Um, Jay, if it's okay at this time, I'd like to go ahead and take up the emergency resolution. Um, are you going to be uh, joining us on that one, or Kimmy going to be joining us on that one? Oh, uh, that'll be me. Okay, very good. So late Friday, because of the potential for long-term shutdown on the highway and at 169 and the storms, um, as the OES director, I declared an emergency and uh, it's required within seven days that the board take up that uh, declaration and either ratify it or not. And essentially what this is, is a step forward in anticipation that perhaps the state of California, the governor will actually declare an emergency um, for last chance for grades and possibly the storms. And so at this point, um, the declaration before you addresses specifically Highway 101 and uh, the storm-related uh, shutdowns and the potential need for additional resources if that continues to persist. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, move for approval. Thank you, Supervisor. Second. We have a motion and second on the table. Further discussion from the board? Okay, let's go ahead and go with public comment. Kylie, any public comment? Chair, I'm not seeing any raised hands at this time. All right, we'll go ahead and bring it back to you, Kylie, and can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Brookwitz? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, let's go ahead and move to item number 12 on our agenda, which is approve and adopt the Delnut County Planning Commission's uh, procedure manual as requested by County Council. Yes, hi, uh, Chair Howard and board. Thank you, I'm here to present that item. And uh, I hope that the manual itself uh, uh, speaks clearly to its purpose and intent. Um, this was a coordinated effort, obviously, with the Community Development Department. And uh, personally, I'm, I'm proud that it came in under five pages. I think it packs a lot of, uh, <laughs> I think it packs a lot of good and valuable information into a short uh, package. And I, I hope that it's gonna provide a lot of value to the uh, staff and to the commissioners and to the public about uh, the, the Planning Commission's uh, procedures. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about that document. I'll just make a quick comment and then we'll turn to Supervisor Hemmingson. Um, and I'm extremely glad to see this, this uh, guidance document policy move forward for our consideration today. I know there's been a lot of concern with the Planning Commission in the last couple of years that have been not only raised by the community, but also staff members, especially as it relates to conflict of interest. And so I'm super happy to see that addressed in here and also the potential removal of commissioners for that matter. So appreciate your time on this, uh, Autumn, and thank you for getting it to the board. Uh, Supervisor Hemmingson. Yeah, thanks, uh, Autumn, I appreciate it. It looks really good. Uh, did we not have a policy uh, 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 procedure uh, procedures uh, manual in place prior to this? That is correct. Okay. As far as I could tell, there was 
there was nothing. It's uh, it's authorized, but um, had never been drafted or adopted. Great. Well, thank you for doing that. Uh, uh, yeah, looks good. Thanks. Sure does. Okay. Well, with that, I'll accept any motion from the board. I would move for approval. Thank you, Supervisor. I'll, I'll second that as well. We have a second from Supervisor Short. Kylie, public comment, please. Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay. Go ahead and bring it back to the board for a poll vote. Supervisor Kyle? Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Okay, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and move forward with budget transfer items. We have uh, five currently on our agenda today. It is my understanding that there needs to be some clarity on uh, one or more of those uh, transfer items. And I believe Super, uh, Director Snow is gonna weigh in on that. Thank you, Chair Howard. Yes, um, for numbers 15 and 17, um, the Chief of Probation asked me to clarify um, in our discussion and summary, we referred to the previously approved budget by the probation department. It's actually the um, approved budget by the CP, the Community Corrections Partnership. So I would just make that clarification, please. All right, thank you very much. So we'll uh, move forward with approving and adopt him, adopting budget transfer items number 02-01 in the amount of $5,000, uh, 0204 in the amount of $20,000, um, budget transfer item 0205 in the amount of $5,000, transfer item 0206 in the amount of $29,306, and transfer item 02-07 in the amount of $30,000. So we have moved. a motion, please. We have a motion on the table. A second. And a second. Kylie, public comment on these items? Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay. We'll go ahead and then bring it back to the board for a poll vote. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Okay. Moving into legislative and budget issues where we consider miscellaneous legislative and budget matters pertinent to the county of Delanoid. Authorize the chair to sign and send appropriate letters where respect to board matters pending before the state and federal governments. We have an item 18, which is approve and authorize the county administrative officer to sign a purchase order for Google workplace licenses for the period of February 10th, 2021 through February 9th, 2024 in the amount of $242,181 with annual payments of $80,727 as requested by the Director of Information Technology. Uh, Dan, are you with us today or would like to discuss this well with the board? Uh, I am here showing up under County of Delmar. Um, that's how I'm connected into this meeting. Uh, right. the, the memo is there. We've used Google since uh, 2012. Um, they changed the naming of Google and plus we're looking at uh, purchasing the license through a, a different vendor. We don't, you can't purchase directly from Google. So part of that required just change in how we, how we order the services. We've been ordering services every year. It hasn't been an issue, but this change required and we received a significant discount with a three-year commitment. Um, so to do that, we need this purchase order. There's no, no different agreements or anything in place still using the same software, but some additional features um, that requires us. So it's a very slight increase of about $5,000 per year. Um, so I'm open to any questions. Very good. Any questions from for Dan from the board? I don't have a question. I just wanna say that I appreciate the fact that you looked into other options uh, prior to bringing it to us so that that was, a, if we would have had that question, you already answered it for us. So I just wanted to tell you, thank you for doing that. And I would move to approve and authorize. Okay, we have a motion on the table. I'll second. Okay, we have a second. Kylie, is there any public comment? 
Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. All right, then we'll go ahead and pull it back to the board. Kylie, can you please take a poll vote? Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, number 19 on our agenda is receive and file the mid-year budget update as submitted by the County Administrative Officer, the Auditor Controller and the Assistant County Administrative Officer and direct the departments to maintain revenue and expenditures as estimated in mid-year report and continue on solutions to reduce net county costs as it requested by the CAO. Jake? Yeah, this is the annual snapshot, basically a review of mid-year, just past mid-year that uh, um, we would take in, generally we're focused on the general fund. Um, Non-general fund submits also, but um, the fluctuation in the general fund is uh, usually more significant than you'll see in a non-general fund, but um, a mid-year budget memo is sent out. There are projections that are sent in by each individual department. Uh, those are reviewed for any, any of those significant fluctuations. And then ultimately, if there's an issue, we bring that before the board with a correction. At this point, um, in looking at what's been submitted, most of the uh, department revenues are looking to be consistent with their original projections. Uh, there was noted one potential issue, but uh, it might have to do with the actual receiving of revenue through billing and through the DA's office. And the DA has indicated that they're um, billed up to the last 12% of uh, what they've uh, done for the Pelican Bay prison prosecution. So we're not terribly uh, worried about that at this point until we see if whether the state might delay uh, payment. Um, when looking at it overall, it looks like the departments have done a pretty solid job of maintaining their costs as well as projecting out the revenue that they're going to receive. Uh, we have seen some, some encouraging signs in regards to a few of the revenues that are coming in. They're slightly above projection. They're not horribly significant, meaning not hundreds of thousands of dollars. But um, when, we, when we submit a budget uh, to the Board of Supervisors in the fall, um, those are based on projections of uh, revenue that's going to come in. And it looks like everybody's been pretty diligent in projecting those revenues. Um, I will note that there's a couple of them in there that um, uh, seem to be a little higher than others. Uh, right now, the transit occupancy tax is uh, projected to come in about $25,000 higher than what was projected originally. And uh, the cannabis tax with the agreement with Up Valley is coming in. Um, it, that one's actually about 80% higher than what was uh, projected. So those will assist as you take up a budget in Starting in April, we'll be starting the budget meetings. And then, as you know, that pro progresses all the way through to the fall when there's a final budget before the board. Um, at this point, the recommendations that are before you, um, we have no additional action of the board. And uh, we will start meeting with the uh, departments in April. Are there any questions, uh, Clint? Uh, Shad is available, myself and Neil. Sure. Sure. I, um, I appreciate the uh, explanation and some of the comments as it relates to um, where the general fund maybe saw some increased revenues last year. Obviously, we went into 2020, early February, thinking that things not be, might, not, might not be rosy. And Obviously, TOT wasn't expected. Um, not sure where those revenues are being seen uh, in TOT as, as specifically breakdown between hotels, motels, or is it vacation rentals? And then in addition, is, is it also reflected in sales tax? So are the, are the county sales tax areas seeing similar type revenue projections? Um, so no, appreciate 
you uh, briefly covering those, Jay. What I really wanted to um, touch on with the board as it relates to this is the specifically the sheriff and the jail and some of the comments that were outlined in the report, uh, you know, trying to, to deal with this overtime issue. And I guess my concern is this, um, and I know staff is moving as quickly as they can, looking for an April 1 revenue collection type period for the measure R uh, sales tax revenues. And I know we're working uh, diligently with our bargaining units to try to get things moving along there. What I want to ensure, especially when there might not be uh, filled positions or other type of things that could be exacerbating um, those type of overtime revenues because other people have to come in and fill for shifts. I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can as a board, fulfilling our promises to the community that voted for Measure R and maybe trying to fast track as much as possible the implementation and expenditure of some of those revenues that we see. So um, really appreciate all the efforts of staff to get this, uh, this report in. Um, but I do want to address that issue. And I'm not sure if it, you have the ability to expand it on this time other than to uh, say that I know you're working on it. And I do appreciate all the efforts of both yourself and Neil and Clint to, to get this to us. Well, in regards to some of the comments you just made, no, we are not able to expand on those now because they, they, they're a collective bargaining issue. So, um, yeah, that this would not be the place to discuss those. Um, and like I said, we're, we're only about a month and a half out from starting a new budget process also. And those will be um, issues that we'll have to bring up with the board here after that, uh, uh, as well as part of the proposed. Thank you. Other questions for Jay? Okay. Kylie, is there any comments at this time? Sure, I'm not seeing any raised hands online. Okay. Then this was just a receive and file. There's no action that's necessary at this time. Kylie, Kylie, I don't believe there was anything that we missed, but can you confirm that for me, please? Sure, I would just like to clarify with council because on number two, it just says direct that departments maintain revenue and expenditures. I just wanna make sure there doesn't need to be a vote on that. You could do a vote. I mean, you know, we direct staff by consensus all the time. But if you wanted to pull a vote, um, you could. Consensus is fine, I just wanted to clarify. Okay. I'm assuming everybody has consensus on this. I didn't hear a lot of questions or comments. So yeah, I see thumbs up, thumbs up. I think you have your consensus there, Kylie. Thank you. I'm all sure right. I have not missed anything. Okay, appreciate it. So we uh, did not finish closed session this morning and we'll be going back into closed session after this board meeting. Uh, most likely we'll have nothing to report out afterwards. So I uh, Appreciate everybody's time and joining us today and look forward to seeing you all at our first meeting in April. Sure, if we could uh, take about 10 minutes before we go back into closed session, you'll okay. get a Zoom invite for that one. 10 minutes would be perfect. Correct. I think we're all in agreement with you on that, Jay. And Chris, just to clarify, you said our first meeting in April, our next meeting's on March 9th, right. 2021. Right about that again, Kylie. Thank Super you. Super observant today. Okay, see you all soon. See you soon, thank you.